So, if you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and open them up to Romans chapter 14. We're going to start chapter 14 today, and uh, we'll get uh, about halfway-ish through it. Uh, we're going to talk today, uh, so, so basically, you know, if you've been paying attention at all, at all to where we've been in Romans, there's this trend he's been going towards. Um, we talked last week about love and how we are to be a people characterized by the love of God. We talk about what that meant, that it was a, a, a heartfelt a loyal affection for uh, that's that's come up comes about in godly ways for the object of our love. So we talk about loving God. We talk about loving each other, and that heartfelt loyal affection is uh, something that we we seek to we seek to have as part of who we are, and we ask God to transform us so that we love well. So that dovetails very nicely into the next part. It's almost like he had this planned. But we're talking about welcoming those who are different. Because guess what? We're different. <laughs> Some of us are a little bit more different than others. Uh, but that's sort of the way it is. Our big idea is that keeping in mind the definition of love from last week, the heartfelt loyal affection that seeks the good of uh, our, its object in godly ways, that keeping that definition in mind, we are charged with welcoming those who are different from ourselves. Now, that needs to be unpacked. <laughs> Right? It's not just because what you will find in the culture at large, something similar sounding to this, but it's not the same. And so we need to walk through what the Bible means when we talk about this idea of welcoming those who are different from ourselves. So Paul will give us two examples of this. Two examples of how this looks in practice, and then he will uh, kind of elaborate a little bit more. So, the, the two dominant categories of people that Paul has been addressing in the book of Romans are, they're all Christian, but some of them are Gentile Christian, they're non-Jewish, and some of them are Jewish Christian. So, this is what he does. He Point number one, if you're following along in your sermon notes... Paul uses the example of Old Testament dietary restrictions. Old Testament dietary restrictions. Because within the church of the first century, there were Jewish Christians, there were Gentile Christians. And many of the Jewish Christians continued to maintain a lot of the practices of the Old Testament law in regards to honoring God with their faith by practicing some of those things. So, Paul will address that here. So, dietary restrictions restrictions is the first example. So Romans chapter 14 verses 1 through 4. Romans chapter 14 starting in verse 1. As for the one who is weak. Now I want you to take note of that word weak here because it's probably not going to mean exactly what you think it means. Hold on to that word. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Poor guy. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. And let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. For God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls. And he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. All right. So, he begins with this really sort of interesting phrase. As for the one who is, and he uses that word, weak. And we will have all sorts of assumptions about what he means by that word. And we actually need to back off a step here and, uh, and understand there's some background here that we need to understand before we dive in there. Weak in the Greek language here, is the exact same word 
that if you were to read an Old Testament translation in Greek, it's called the Septuagint, and it's dominantly what the apostles would be using when they're composing the New Testament and quoting the Old Testament in it. Okay, uh, it's a, so it, it, the, the, the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament shows up 200, 250 ish years before the time of Christ. So, in the Old Testament, the Septuagint, the, the Greek Old Testament, the word that's used for kosher is the same word that's used here as weak. Okay. So, there's some discussion, if you were to go and read some commentaries on Romans, like I have been doing this last week, week, different week there, about that word week and how it's used. And some are, are questioning whether or not the Old Testament dietary practices are in view here. And there's a reason that that's put in question. Right? And the reason that it's put in question is because he says this. Let's go back and read the text. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only what? Guess what there's no kosher dietary thing about? There's no law on you only eat vegetables. So what's this about? Well, I think I found the answer. I hope I found the answer. This is where I'm going. So there is this Old Testament situation that a number of Old Testament Jews find themselves in. So there was this kingdom called Israel, and it fell out of favor with its God because they were doing idolatry and they were failing to keep the sabbatical year of the land and they were doing all sorts of other things that displeased God. And so God punished his people to refine them for later by bringing another nation upon them, a nation called Babylon. And Babylon came, destroyed Jerusalem. They show up three times in 606, 596, and 587 BC. And at the last one, they're taking all of these Jewish um, aristocrats and they're they're taking them into exile and they begin to train them to be ba good Babylonians and there's a there's a number of them that we actually meet in the scripture Daniel Hananiah Mishael and Azariah or you know you might know their 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 Babylonian names Shadrach Meshach and Abednego Okay? But there's this moment in the book of Daniel that looks like this. Daniel chapter 1, verses 8 through 16. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food, because it wasn't kosher, or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who has signed your favor food and your drink. For why should he see that you were worse condition than the youths who are of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. Then Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed before you and deal with your servants according to what you see. So here's this little thing that's going on. Daniel and his mates find themselves in exile in an, a hostile pagan nation where they are being essentially forced to break God's laws by eating non-kosher food. And so Daniel says, no, I'm not going to do that. So he seeks a path around that. He, in a very pagan environment, proposes a change in the program for himself and his friends. And that change is, just give us vegetables, which sounds a little similar to what Paul says. Now here's where that connection comes. Rome and Babylon are very similar situations. They're highly paganized environments. They're not only highly paganized environments, but they're highly pressuring 
paganized environments that are trying to get everybody into the same basic religious stamp. And there's a big re new religious stamp going on at the time that Paul is writing Romans. It's called the emperor cult. They're just now coming into the point where they're saying things like Caesar is actually not just a human ruler, but he's, he's God. So when they would say Caesar is Lord, that's actually what they're, they're thinking. Because that was a common greeting in the day. So there's this pressure. There is this, this sort of push towards getting everybody in the same stamp of belief. And so the people who were, who are of kind of the more Jewish persuasion at the time that Paul is writing to the Romans that are in the church have sought some way to continue to honor God according to the Old Testament law. And I'm guessing that vegetable thing is it because they know the book of Daniel and they said, well, we know what Daniel did. Let's do that. So he's talking about weakness, not in terms of they have no strength or their faith is without strength. But he's talking simply about the method in which they're trying to honor God. They're trying to honor God by doing the kosher thing. And he says, that's OK. And it's OK if you don't do that. That's not the point of the law. Because we looked at the point of the law last week. What was the law actually driving at? It was driving at the people of God being in harmony with one another and in harmony with God. That's what it sought. And so that's why Paul last week said, love is the fulfillment of the law. Love is the fulfillment of the law. So Paul says, look, as for the one who is weak, welcome him. Because there's probably way more Gentile Christians in the church in Rome than there are Jewish Christians. Or even people who were Gentiles but who had at one point converted to Judaism and have then converted to Christianity. So he says, look, welcome him. Welcome this kind of person. And not to quarrel over opinions. Not to quarrel over opinions. The dietary issue, he says, is this. It's not cardinal. It's not primary. It's secondary, maybe even tertiary. Notice that he attaches the word opinion to it at this point. It's not ruining somebody's faith to not keep kosher. It's not ruining somebody's faith to keep kosher. Don't fight about this, he says. That's not what you're supposed to do. He says, what you're supposed to do is welcome each other because you do have a like faith. And that faith is not in your dietary restrictions or liberations. It is in Christ who set you free. It is in Christ who forgave your sin. If you want to honor God through the dietary laws, that's okay. If you don't, that's okay. He says, let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. And let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. Some Christians carry a false notion, by the way that the early church was this sort of golden age of harmony and unity. And that is a joke historically, let me tell you. They were a mess. Go read 1 Corinthians. They're a big mess. It sort of gives us hope for where we are today. <laughs> Right? We can be messy sometimes. But what we have to recall is that there are things that are primary and there are things that are secondary or even, as I said, tertiary. And we cannot confuse these. We cannot confuse these because it's not helpful to do so. He then says, who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? 
It is before his own master that he stands or falls. So one of the, one of the main kind of language thing that gets applied to the church throughout the Bible is, this, is the language of a family. How many of you, show your hands, came from a family? <laughs> yes, all of you. We know what that looks like. How many of you had a brother or a sister? Most of us. How many of you had children and those children had a brother or a sister, right? We know what it looks like, right? We, under, we have a basic understanding of this family thing. Now, how many of you as a brother or a sister or having children that were brothers and sisters ever noticed this tendency for the children to try to begin to parent one another? Yeah, uh-huh. No, no, you can't do that. Nope, that's not. No, no. We have this thing where occasionally we have to say to some of our own kids, um, you're not the parent. You're not the mom. You're not the dad. That's not for you. Stop that. We'll take care of that. And the same thing sometimes happens in the church, the family of God. Brothers and sisters in Christ can sometimes go, oh, excuse me, but, and, and take something secondary, take something maybe even tertiary, and try to make it primary, and try to correct somebody. That's not how this works. He says, who are you to judge the servant of another? You're not their master. You're not their master. They will stand or fall before their own master, not you. It's sometimes that way in the church as brothers or sisters in Christ. We sometimes want to parent each other when God is the parent. And, and over, over certain matters, there are important matters that we ought to speak up about. You know, we could, let's go the easier route. Let's talk doctrinal matters. Let's talk about the deity of Jesus Christ, that, that Jesus Christ is God in human flesh. We need to talk. We need to fight for that one. Because we have these cults that are out there that call themselves Christian and are not. Mormonism, they're not Christian. They believe Jesus Christ was human and became a God. What about Jehovah's Witnesses? They believe Jesus Christ was not God and said rather he was an angel. Both of those are false and we divide over that kind of thing. But dietary restriction, we don't divide over that. We don't punch each other's lights out over that one. We we can discuss, we can have conversation, we can talk, and we go, well, that's interesting. Well, what do you do with this passage? We can have those kinds of conversations, but what we don't do is we don't go the superiority route. That's not how this family runs. So as you continue on through Daniel, so he listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh, I guess me hope, than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine they were able to drink and gave them vegetables. And it worked out for them. And it wasn't a problem then. It's not a problem apparently in Rome. So why would we get in a tizzy over it? Number two, Paul uses the example of Old Testament festivals. Paul uses the example of Old Testament festivals. Okay? Romans chapter 14, verses 5 through 9. Verses 5 through 9. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself. And none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, 
Whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. So, one person esteems one day as better than another. And then he says, each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. And I want to zero in on that. The key thing to recall when assessing ourselves, because before we have this kind of conversation with somebody else that we think we ought to have a talkman to about something that is maybe secondary or tertiary, is this. I ought to assess myself and make sure I've done my work with Jesus before I'm going to try to make them do their work with Jesus. Right? And, and this is because it's so much easier to not look at me and to look at somebody else that looks like maybe they're a little bit off and go, well, I'm going to go help them. Hold on. I seem to recall Jesus having something about a, a speck and a plank in the eye. Does anybody recall that? Before you go and remove that teeny tiny little speck out of your neighbor's eye, maybe you'll want to deal with a plank in your own. Have you done your work with Jesus? Have you done business with Jesus? Are you doing your sanctification work with Jesus? Because if not, you got no business trying to help somebody else. You got zero business trying to help somebody else. So back off. He says, the one who observes, observes in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord. The one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord. And they give thanks, and the one who eats gives thanks. The key thing to recall when dealing with others, so the first one that I just said was dealing with ourselves. Now, the key thing to recall in dealing with others who differ from us is that the variety of practices or abstinences are both, in this case, biblically informed. Do you notice that? There's biblical precedence on the we keep the kosher thing. There's biblical precedence on the you actually don't have to keep kosher thing. Both are biblical. And it's not as if it's a confused book with contradictions. It's that it's a generous book that is doing different things with different people different ways. Because God is interesting. He's very interesting in how he runs this whole thing. He says, look, both of these things are, are biblically informed and they both seek the same object. Do you notice that? They both seek to honor the Lord. They both seek to honor the Lord. It says, for none of us lives to himself. None of us dies to himself. So then, whether we live or we die... We are the Lord's. You know what the, the, the key thing to keep in mind regarding ourselves and others? None of us belong to ourselves. If you are in Christ, you belong to Christ. Our culture will tell you, you are your own person. You do what's good for you. Um, you don't have that in Christ. What you have in Christ is Christ has decided what is best for you and you obey Him. You obey Him. You don't get to make up the rules. Do you know why? Because if you made up the rules, you'd make up bad rules. That's how that works. Because we see it time and again. That's why people end up hitting people with hammers. Somebody decided they had a better way and they were going to show the other person. That is godless and we reject that Paul just talked about that in Romans we don't take vengeance we don't make up that rule we don't decide when to do that that's on God to decide and sometimes he meets out that through justice sometimes he waits till the end so we don't maintain self ownership I'm not my own person I belong to Christ I am his servant. I'm his child. I follow his house rules. I don't get to make up my own. 
Then he says, for to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord, both of the living and of the dead. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection and ascension purchased the redemption of those who believe, and, and he has awakened us then to his lordship over us. Because Jesus isn't just your savior. He's your Lord. He's your master. He's in charge of you. He's in charge of me. This is why when people say things like, well, I could never believe in God because he just seems so mean. Yeah, what standard are you using? Probably something in yourself, right? Do you meet that standard? No, you don't. You don't meet your own standard. You can't meet God's standard, but what you can do is have Jesus Christ meet God's standard on your behalf. Let's pick that one. But I don't own myself. I don't get to make my best decisions. I make decisions based on what God has revealed for me in his word that are best. That's what I go for. Jesus is Lord over me. And that's our third point. Jesus Christ is Lord, and we are not. Jesus Christ is Lord, and we are not. Romans 14, 10 through 12. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or why do you despise your brother, he asks. Who do you think you are? Who do, who do you think you are in doing that? This prohibits despising and condemning brothers and sisters in Christ in matters that are not primary. You don't get to do that. Now, here's what it doesn't prohibit. And we also need to say this because this is the photo negative of it. It doesn't prohibit discernment. It doesn't prohibit us being discerning people. But it does caution us against the poor practice of discernment. And let me tell you, as someone who spent more than five minutes on the internet, on Christian websites that are discernment apologetic websites, there's a whole heck of a lot of passing judgment on people who are not their servants. There's a whole heck of a lot of that. There's going to be some answering to God for that that probably is not going to be pleasant. Now, that doesn't say we don't use discernment. It just says we're discerning about our discernment. We have to be very careful. And we have to focus on that which is primary. Focus on that which is primary. As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. A day is coming, brothers and sisters in Christ, when everyone will stand personally before the judgment seat of God and give an account. Me, you, all of us, nobody's exempt from that. And all that is wrong shall be set right. That's what judgment means. Judgment doesn't mean punishment. It may include that. But the word judgment means taking that which is wrong and setting it right again. That's what the judgment of God does. In some case, it punishes wickedness. In some case, it rewards righteousness. But in every case, it is just and right and good and true. 
and everyone will stand before it. No one will escape having to do that. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. All will stand before the judgment seat of God, where all we are and have done will be laid bare. Everything we've done in the dark will be brought into the light. Everything. Everything. It should cause us to go, hmm, before we make those choices. We should be far more concerned about the account we will personally have to give before the throne of Christ than anyone else's account that they will have to give. And that's the point here. This is what Paul is driving at when he says, look, don't, don't go after somebody else on a secondary matter that you probably don't understand to begin with. Because you will have to give your own account. They will have to give theirs. Let them do work with Jesus on that. You do work with Jesus on you. Let us not forget, in all of this, we have been welcomed ourselves, being very different from Christ. We have nevertheless been welcomed into his family. So when we look at each other and we find differences, which we will, what do we do about that? What do we do about that? We welcome each other. And we may not understand each other. We may look at each other and go, hmm, I don't get it. I am a dyed-in-the-wool Calvinist. Some of you don't get that. Some of you are dyed-in-the-wool Arminians. I don't get that. I used to be, but I'm not. Some of you are like, I don't even know what either of those things mean. Okay. We're still part of the same family. We're still part of the same crew. We're still part of the same church. Christ has welcomed us all into this weird melting pot. And it is weird. And that's okay. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace to welcome us who are very different from you into your family. Help us, Father, to welcome those who are different from us. Help us to be generous in our love for one another as a sign and a symbol of our love for you. Help us to trust in you and help us to welcome. Regardless of difference, regardless of whatever, help us to be helpful for one another. We pray all of this in your name. Amen.